listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, Gene. Johnson. After Buzz TV. After Buzz TV. From Los Angeles, California, and Maria Menounos, and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies, this is AfterBuzz TV's The Voice Of. The Voice Of is a long-form interview series featuring the voice talent behind your favorite characters and announcers from TV, movies, the internet, and video games. And now, from the world's number one TV after-show platform, this is AfterBuzz TV's The Voice Of. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the first episode of AfterBuzz TV's new long-form interview series, The Voice Of. It features long-form interviews with announcers, people from video games, animation, TV, and commercials all across the industry of the voice actor industry. Today I am joined with a special guest who span, whose career has spanned over the decades with amazing spots in commercials, amazing spots in a few television shows, and as well as in a music career that's just outstanding. We have in studio with us Mr. Phil Levitt. Thank you for joining us today, Phil Levitt. My pleasure, Stephen. Nice oh, to see you. It's good to see you again. I, <laughs> I've, I've known you for a little bit now, not too personally, but it's, it's definitely cool to get you across the table from me to ask some questions and pick your brain about this. This is about the inaugural this. show? This is the inaugural. This is the first show. We, we've had, we had an interview, but we didn't have everything ready for it, so you know we got I realize this is the first show. I feel like I feel really special to be here on the first You should, show. because you're going to have a lot of insight yeah. into how to break into this industry right. just a little bit and kind of how... Just kind of a little bit of advice, a little bit of a uh, little bit of storytelling, and you know, all around shenanigans from right. from life. Great, because you're all about the shenanigans. I'm assuming. <laughs> well, you can see by my hat. That I must of be. course, the hat looks good though. You're Thank good. You. I mean, I saw the shoes earlier, right? Yeah. Should I show the shoes? You can show the shoes if you really want to. It's up to you. I uh, mean, did you get that? We. Right. I'm sure we got that. <laughs> So I want to talk about a little bit more of your early life to yeah. break into this real quick. So you grew up in Las Vegas. So what was that like growing up in Las Vegas as now in, you moved to another big city, which is Los Angeles? Was there a big difference? And would you move back to L or Las Vegas to start a family or would you prefer like the L.A. area? Well, um, you know, back when I was uh, growing up in Vegas, it was a lot different than it is now. It was, a, it was a small town vibe. I mean, if you ever saw the movie Casino, the mm -hmm. Martin Scorsese film, the, uh, the film kind of looks like my home movies. I grew up there in the 70s. So, you know, it was the strip was obviously happening, but uh, I lived, you know, far, way out east, which was basically in the desert at that time. It's totally built up now. But at that time, literally across the street from my house was sand dunes. Oh. And we wouldn't go, you know, you wouldn't go to the strip. My grandfather worked at the Stardust Hotel. We'd go in there uh, for lunch to meet him, but that's the only time we'd be on the strip. Otherwise... It's like living in a small town, small town USA, played Little League Baseball in the 107 you know, degree heat in the summertime. <laughs> uh, but as the years went by, Las Vegas really exploded. And um, by the time I left in the late 70s, I was still a kid. Uh, it was starting to change there a little bit. But, you know, nothing compared. When I got to L.A., it was real. It was culture shock for sure, because it's a sprawling, you know, city, obviously. Oh, it's crazy. And it's been going for so long now right. in its entirety. Um with you being in a small town vibe and then having that, even though it was still developing at the time, going into what Vegas has now become, seeing that as a kid, did that kind of affect you with ambition and like kind of give you inspiration to kind of want to be in the spotlight a little bit? Well, you know, I was a, I was a performer, you know, like a lot of performers. I was uh, I started when I was really little. My, I have a cousin who's a few years older than me and she uh, she would uh, we'd put on shows together when she'd come to vi to visit. You know, we were she turned me on to the Beatles. I was a Beatles fanatic as a little kid, and we would put on these shows. I started performing when I was you know five six years old. So what would these shows be? Uh, <laughs> standing up there with tennis rackets, miming to music, <laughs> singing. You know, doing the vocals along with the, uh, the the playing the record, singing along, doing dance routines. I mean, she had me doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, some of it's captured on home movies, um, but. You know, that started it. I, was, I started performing really early in my life. And, did, uh, you know, I just never stopped. Did you have a favorite thing that you ever performed? Like when you went to your parents, you were like, hey, I want to perform this for you guys. What song now, would that have been? Uh, you know, I don't know about that. I mean, my, my cousin was the ringleader, as I said. And she would, we would dream up these shows and there would be, you know, we'd do whole records. One time we did this whole thing to Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. 
the, the whole album. You know, we, we would really get into it. I didn't know. I don't know if I had a favorite. I mean, I loved the Beatles as a, like an eight year old kid. I was really into it. And um, so their, their music at that time really had a had a big influence on my life. So obviously you made it very known that you were interested in being a performer and you love performing in front of people. Did your parents ever kind of help that along? Like, did they take you to classes or just encourage you to be more out in the open with plays yeah. or anything? I don't know if you've done acting in high school or anything like that. Well, I was in the, I was in the pit orchestra in high school. I was you were always, the drum major. Uh, yeah, I was a drum major of my high school marching band right down the street, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, I was in the uh, orchestra that played for the musicals. Um, but, uh, you know, even as a, as a, uh, like a 11 year old kid, I was, uh, uh, you know, my mom got me a, <laughs> my elementary school had a, a school mascot. I was in the tiger suit. <laughs> um, I mean, I was always out there doing something. Um, and yeah, she encouraged me, took me to drum lessons when I was, you know, seven years old and I would play on the dashboard and then she would grab the sticks and whack me, you know, to, to get me to stop. Um, but, uh, just with love, of course, no child yeah, abuse. Of course. You know? Um, so yeah, she uh, she had a, my, my my parents were very supportive of what I was doing. So where did the drumming come from? Because I know you started you've been playing drums since you were like five years old. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you probably had your cousin introduced you to the Beatles, but anyone who hears the Beatles could be either like, I want to be John or I want to be Ringo. <laughs> right. um, usually people don't want to be Ringo right, right. after they hear the Beatles. But like, what was it? What was it about drums that when you see somebody on stage, you see the guitarist wailing out, you see the singer, you see the David Coverdale out there rocking it out. Mm. What makes you see the drummer and be like, I want to be that guy? I don't know, man. It was one of those. It's just one of those natural. You know, you're attracted to certain things in life. You have. You don't even know why. But I think the first time I saw a drummer on TV, I was locked on that guy. And always, when I was listening to music, I was hearing the rhythm. You know, I was focusing on that. Where some people, like you said pay more attention to the guitar player or the singer. I don't know, there was something about it. The, the primal element of it, you know, pounding that, that beat out really was appealing to me. And then I started to see, you know, uh, like Buddy Rich on the old uh, Tonight Show with Johnny mm -hmm. Carson. And I would stay up really late, you know, I'm, I'm nine years old. And Buddy Rich is on and I would stay up late and watch him and uh, be really just amazed by obviously his drumming, but also what kind of a personality he was because he would come and sit down next to Carson and have a whole guest spot, you know, like any actor or comedian. And it just kind of like having a drummer be that. There weren't, there weren't any other guys like that. So, so it was a big in inspiration to me, too. Was there any, was there any like, <clears throat> difficulties with drumming when you first started out? Did you ever have any lack of, not lack of inspiration, but more, did you ever just kind of get a little bit like, you know, maybe this isn't for me, and then kind of focus on other things for a bit and then go back to it? Yeah, well, you know, it's always like, it's always been sort of a love, uh, it's a love-hate relationship with music sometimes. You know, sometimes it's so frustrating that you have to put it down. You can't get something. I mean, it's a, playing drums is a difficult instrument. I mean, any instrument, to do it well is, uh, is difficult. But um, there's so much to it. And uh, sometimes you get burned out, but I always came back. So when you got burned out, did you kind of go to voice talent as a fun thing to do? Because, I, I mean, I've, we've heard your commercials. In fact, we're going to go ahead and play a uh, short audio clip right now just so we can hear your voice. Because I've heard your voice automatically, like, doing the interview, but you sound so different in the commercials. Mm. So let's go ahead and play that. This is a, a Craftsman commercial from back in 2010. Right. Uh, go ahead and throw that up there, Marissa. Introducing the Craftsman Cordless Multi-Tool. Remodel. Regrout. Restore. All repowered. Meet the hand tool. Rethought. The power and versatility of six tools packed into one. More innovations. More great values. Craftsman. Trust in your hands. So what I find interesting about the spots like these is that everybody, whenever you hear a voice, you put a, you put a face in your mind. And you never, what, what the casting directors, when they're casting voice talent, is they're, they're looking for a certain face that's going to go to everybody's mind when they hear that commercial, and that's the demographic that's going for the commercial. So when I hear that, um, no offense to you, I don't see you. <laughs> I see like a, I see like maybe a 23, 24 year old guy, like not too shaven but kind of rugged, li ready right. to like build his build his like workbench and kind of build something in his garage or something like that. So it's kind of interesting to me to always see the aspects of what voice actors sound like and then what they look like. So what do you do to kind of, you know, achieve 
this this different voice for what they're asking for? Because I know you did go to the Kalmanson voice acting school in Burbank. I did. Yes, I did. Uh, you know, I, I, I took a lot of classes around town when I got into this. I'd actually, um, you know, music was always my thing from, from the very beginning. But at a certain point in my career, I ended up uh, going out to Las Vegas. I know you, we're going to talk about this, but I ended up going out to Vegas to do Blue Man Group. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was out there, I decided to take some some voiceover classes because I had fooled around with it with a friend of mine. Um, you know, we'd go to the Dodger games and sit next to each other and, you know, pretend we were Vince Scully, like at each <laughs> other or do the game, you know, uh, as, a, as a duo. And so actually it started out here. He had gone to a class. This was at a time when uh, my band that I had been in for a long time lost its record deal. We, we didn't have anything going on. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll take one of these classes and see, you know, if I have a feel for this or not. And um, so I took a class and I found that, you know, I actually, I kind of liked it. You know, I liked reading out loud. I mean, that's really <laughs> the first thing is the ability to read, copy, clean, make no mistakes, you know, make very few mistakes and make it sound as if it's coming right off the top of your head, like we're having a conversation. So, um, you know, I, I felt like I had a natural ability for it. And then I went out to Vegas to do, uh, to work on Blue Man Group for a while. And I took some classes out there and put a tape together. And, um, you know, because you have to have a demo reel. Mm -hmm. uh, and I sent it to a, a, a local uh, agency in Las Vegas, and they ended up picking me up, and I did a couple of, like, local bus company spots. Uh, but I found, you know, doing it, trying to make money at it was a lot different than being in class because suddenly I was nervous in front of the microphone, you know, and you have to kind of get past all that and get your confidence up. Um, so uh, when I, I came back out here eventually and... Uh, Took some more classes, like uh, the Kalmanson class, which is over there in uh, Burbank, uh, for like six weeks. And you, you, uh, you read in a group, and people get to critique you, and you get some direction from uh, casting directors, and it, it was very helpful. But as far as, you know, what do you do? Uh, you know, for me, I look at the spec that they give you. At the bottom of the copy, you're going to see a description of what they're looking for. And, uh, you know, I try to, in my mind's ear, hear what I'm supposed to sound like doing that. And, you know, the thing about it is, though, that really you can only be yourself or various versions of yourself. You know, a, a particular attitude is really what you're going for. You're not trying to turn into a different person. I mean, unless you're doing characters or doing heavy accents or something like that, most of the time on commercials, it's just about attitude. You know, craftsman tools, it has to have a rugged feel. It's got to be an everyman kind of a guy who's going to work in his garage. And you have to kind of get that. A lot of it has to do sometimes with how you stand in front of the microphone. You can get your body to feel a certain way to get into that kind of headspace. I mean, we've all worked on something and we've all held a tool. You kind of know how you feel when you do it. You try to get that across. Um, but you really are just doing versions of yourself and either that day that version of you resonates with the casting director or you know if they're looking for an apple and you're an orange you're not going to get the job and that's all there is to it sometimes those things lined up and you uh you know you get one so what what kind of drove you to that point of hey i think i need to i think i need to do this for me because i know you had the, the the record deal dropping out from under yeah. you that was kind of another story for another day yeah but um like at what point were you just like I need to find a job doing something. And while you're with the Blue Man Group, you're just like, you know, because you've always, you've always, you've been a person who will always take any opportunity to kind of put yourself out there in a new way and kind of make a living because you've done so many different things. And we'll get into how many different right. things you've had. But I don't know if you've like ever had a job in the restaurant industry. Like what, <laughs> what made you think like, I cannot go back to yeah. this. I want to do something new and I think I can do voiceover. Well, you know, well, I, I, I why I thought I could do voiceover is just because it felt like something. I, it just felt natural to me to be able to do it. And I found that, like, uh, the instructors were responding to me in class, made a demo tape, got an agent. So things seemed like, okay, it's, it's kind of working. But, yeah, I mean, to make a living in the entertainment business, it, you know, you kind of have to be flexible, I think, and, and looking for opportunities. And you're kind of hustling at all times. You know, you're always hustling out here to, to, to keep yourself out of a day job. I mean, that's what we're all trying to do who, do, who are in the arts. We're just trying to keep doing what we do and somehow make a living doing it. Um, so, yeah, for a long time I thought, I'm going to be hauling my drums out of my trunk when I'm 80 years old. You know, I mean, I didn't think of anything else to do. The last regular job I had was in the late 80s. I was, uh, you know, in my early 20s, and uh, I was working at uh, um, 
EMI music publishing. I was in the business, but on the other side, you mm-hmm. know, and I, I was working uh, in Hollywood. I was like handling their, their micro they, uh, in those days. The, the, uh, actually, I ended up in the tape room making tape copies, cassettes. And what they would do is they would have, uh, you know, one of their somebody, Whitney Houston's looking for songs. So you put together a tape of your writer's work and you send it to the record company and that was my job to compile all these cassettes and you know keep track of all that stuff and at the same time i'm i'm begging guys to put me on their sessions because i'm trying to play you know i finally get on one of the writers there let me play tambourine on one of his tracks and that was like my first session um so at the at the time uh that that uh, record deal came apart and i ended up I mean, I ended up going to Vegas. I had a job. I was working at Blue Man. I was, but I always thought, well, what's going to happen after that? So I, I, I pursued it. And uh, by the time I came back to L.A., I was able to eventually get an agent here and get rolling. And thankfully so, because, you know, you can, you can make decent money doing it, pretty good money. And uh, for a person who's a performer, uh, who's a drummer, I mean, it's hard, man. Hustling as a drummer around L.A. is pretty tough. It's yeah, I mean, tough. for a commercial, for voice, you can get anywhere from ten to thirty thousand dollars for one you commercial. Can. If it really runs, yeah, you can. Plus, it's not you know no heavy lifting. <laughs> it's, it's great. <laughs> you don't have to lug your no. You don't have to lug your drums. I will actually ask you about your equipment because yeah. I know you have your own portable voice booth. Because I know you're on the road a lot with right. your bands. You're on the road a lot with something else that I'll talk about soon. Um, but what kind of gave you the inspiration? Like, look, I need something that's not in my house. Maybe mm. I can put, set it up in a house, but. I need to be on the road and able to do this so I can send anything my agent needs. Over. Yeah, I mean, it's so easy now. Everybody that, that does voiceover for a living, I think, has some kind of either, you know, they have a, a lot of people have a home studio with uh, an ISDN line in it, which is a telephone line connect that, so you can connect to other studios and be in real time with, at the same quality, and you never have to leave your house. I mean, some of the guys who really are cranking in voiceover, they never leave the house. They have their studio and they're working, and I, you know, I've got some friends that just, they're in their booth all day. Um, for me, I travel a lot, like you said. I'm on the road with a band, but I mean, to call it a portable voiceover studio, it's my laptop, oh. a microphone, uh, an adapter that, you know, an interface that the microphone goes in and then it, it comes out and goes into the computer, and then a program on my uh, laptop to record. And that's it. I've done it in hotels, I've done it uh, on tour buses. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, there's not that much to it. It's just basically the microphone. And sometimes, you know, I've, I've put up. Uh, pillows to kind of baffle off the sound a little bit, but a lot of times you don't even need that. Um, it's real easy to do it on the road now. Uh, it didn't used to be, of course, but uh, now I think everybody that does this, because some people, they're working all the time and they can't really even go on vacation. They have to take it with them and they're working from wherever they are. What's a, What kind of modulation do you do to your voice at all, if at all? Like when you put it in, I'm assuming you use Pro Tools? A Pro Tools-like program, sure. Okay. It's real simple though, and, and I have a little effects uh, thing that uh, a guy set up for me that just cuts some of the noise because it's in my house. So sometimes the refrigerator ends up on the uh, on the audition or the session. So I have an EQ that I that I can just click in and that takes down that uh, noise floor a little bit. And uh, I mean, I you know, it's real easy. I'm not a super technical guy, so he made it as simple as possible for me, and that's perfect for me. I'd rather go into a studio and do it and have somebody else handle the engineering part. Some guys are really into it, and they mm-hmm. you know they've got their whole thing set up at home and with compressors and all kinds of stuff that they're running through. I'm not really doing that. I'm doing a really simple thing for auditions, and then if I do a session, I'm going to end up in a studio. And I've worked in studios all over the country while being you know on tour. There's always a a, a room in every major city that has. Uh, you know, capacity to do voiceover stuff. So, do you recommend if you're going to put it, if like for people who are just starting out in voiceover, who mm-hmm. are wanting to get into voiceover? So, for auditions, it's great to have the laptop, the mic, and everything like that. But do you really recommend when you're doing the session, unless you have like really high tech gear, you should probably go into a studio? Uh, well, I think most clients. I mean, if it's a union job, if it's one of the, if it's a national commercial or something like that, that that's going to be done in a recording studio. There's a lot of non-union work going on, and there's all kinds of websites now where people can sign up and catch these jobs from all over the world uh, that are non-union. Uh, you know, for me, I can't. I don't do that stuff because I'm a, a Screen Actors Guild member. But for a lot of people, um, you know, they're doing all this stuff and they can do it from their house on their home computer. But real professional sessions, I think, 99% of them are still done in studios. Do you think the ease at which people can now do voiceovers on their own has kind of has it flooded the market a little bit? Of course. Has absolutely. it made it more difficult to get jobs? Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, you know, and I hear from guys. And I've been I've been at it for about 10 years, and I hear from guys 
that were at it 10 years before that. And they were, they're like, you, you wouldn't have believed what it was like back then because it was so small. I mean, that's what we used to. When I was just getting started, that's the, the, the rep that voiceover had was, this is a really tight industry. You can't get in. If you do get in, it's like a pot of gold, but there's just a really small number of people doing it. Um, and then in the last 10 years, it's just exploded. People have, are doing it all, you know, from their homes all over the world. So, yeah, the competition is much greater. Plus, there's been an influx of celebrities that come and take the jobs that you, scale guys like myself mm -hmm. used to be only competing for with other scale guys. Now there's celebrities on top of it. So it's gotten really tough over the last, uh, you know, five to 10 years. And, and, yeah, the market is flooded with people that want to be voiced, you know, want to be voiceover talent. So what was one of the, the most memorable things you've done in this industry? Like, is there just that one moment where maybe you went into a studio and you met somebody that you never thought you'd meet? Or perhaps you did a commercial and you're just like, man, I nailed that. And you can't, you, you see it on TV and you're like, I can't believe I'm the voice for that. Some of those first ones, yeah, I did a Ford Edge commercial that aired on the Super Bowl. And that was pretty exciting, you know, to hear myself, you know, how the kind of... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, all the excitement about Super Bowl commercials, and to be in one was pretty cool. Um, the first session I ever did, I got, uh, I, I got to my, I, were, I was with my agency for about, I don't know, four months, and I didn't book a job, and then I finally got one, and it was going to be a big job. It was like a, a charter communications or a cable company or some kind of time warrant. I can't even remember what it was now. Um, and I was so nervous the night before that I was up all night, like throwing up all night. Oh, I really got sick. And I called my agent in the morning. I'm like, man, I, am, I can't do it. We got to put this thing off. I am sick. I've been up all night. He's like, get to the studio now. You're, you do not be late. You have to do this. And so I went. It was in Santa Monica. And I, was, I worked all day on this thing because they had a lot of tags and a lot of stuff that they wanted me to do. And, uh, you know, I mean, I felt horrible, but somehow I got through it and uh, he was right, you know, to, to push me out there. And it ended up on the air. It was all on the air. So I must have been doing it right. Uh, so there, there's always something, you know, I've met some interesting people, certainly um, uh, along the way, uh, just, you know, waiting to audition, mm -hmm. that, that kind of thing. I don't tend to do a lot of group reads. I, I'm usually the announcer, so I'm usually by myself. You know, there's some people that work a lot of radio commercials that still have like couples or cup two guys and stuff like that. I don't do that much of that, um, but uh, it's been great so far. You know, it's it's a fun job. There's no doubt about it. It's not you know it's not my lifelong passion like mm -hmm. music, but man, it's you know what a great job in, in show business. I find that so interesting because especially with this industry, talking just the entertainment industry in general, our executive producer Kevin Undergaro, he always tells us he's like, guys, half half the work is just showing up. Mm. So like when you when you tell me about that story where it's like you didn't want to go, you didn't want to go, but you were pushed. Right. If you didn't go, your agent could have dropped you. You might oh, not yeah. have gotten the next job. No, you got to show up, man. You got it. You got it. <laughs> That's it's like so many people are flaky, mm -hmm. you know, and if you're the guy who always shows up, if you're the guy who's on time, if you're the guy who just delivers the goods and it's like you're solid with what you do, you're always, you're always going to work. You're always going to be all right. That's great advice. And I seriously think a lot more people should take that advice down here. Yeah. Um, let me see here. So I do want to talk a little bit more about, um, the other things you're done. So you, mm. you balance music, you balance voice acting, but you balance baseball too. I've played a lot of baseball. Yeah. I, you know, I, I love the game. Um, I played in high school out here. At, oh, look at that. Yeah. I am. <laughs> I am. That's a, that's Yankees hitting coach, Kevin Long. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's me at the pro ball clinic in uh, Phoenix a few years ago uh was a great experience i went to several of those it's like a four-day really intensive kind of like mini spring training with professional coaches and i was always an a, an average kind of player in high school but i came back to the game uh as an adult mm -hmm. and uh this was in a period where i wasn't doing that much music so i had a little time on my hands um just doing voiceover the uh, i wasn't playing that much and so you know, there's a lot of amateur baseball out here in Southern California, a lot of, uh, you know, weekend warrior guys who used to play in college or even some former pros. Uh, there's a big tournament in uh, Phoenix every year that where they, they give, uh, you know, World Series rings. It's like adult little really? league. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the, you know, I won a World Series ring in the 35 and over World Series a few years ago. You don't, you don't wear it all the time? I don't. It's gigantic. <laughs> it's like a car. <laughs> It really looks like a World Series. I mean, it is a World Series ring. It's just gigantic. It's on a conversation feet. starter. It is a conversation piece. I should have worn it today. I, I didn't <laughs> think about it. Uh, I wore my seven-horse ring. But, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it was really fun, and we took it really seriously, and a lot of guys do. have. There's a lot of uh, really serious, uh, you know, adult kids out here playing baseball because, you know, they always say it is. I mean, they're right. It's a kid's game played by adults, even on the professional level. But when you get into the amateur level, guys like who are in show business or whatever we're doing, doctors, plumbers, I mean, you meet all kinds of people on baseball teams. Uh, as opposed to softball, you know, I mean, this is hardball, real baseball, regulation fields, nine innings. Um, it, it was fun. I loved it. And I played pretty solid for about seven, eight years. I was a catcher and uh, it just wore me out, though, man. I mean, I was playing three nights a week, three mm -hmm. days a week. I was really into it. So now I've kind of tapered off. I'm, I'm more into boxing right now. I go, there's a gym uh, in um, North Hollywood that I go to, a place called Pullman's Boxing Gym. And uh, I found that uh, that uh, boxing is uh, such a fantastic way to stay in shape. Yeah. Um, and it's something, you know, when I was running a baseball team, I've got so many guys that I have to deal with. But this is just, a, you know, an individual sport. And um, it's I'm really enjoying that now. I really think baseball sh might have helped you out a lot with boxing because when you're sitting there taking a 90-mile-an-hour pitch to the yeah, face, yeah, maybe. like, you might be a little bit less to flinch when yeah, somebody's throwing a, a fist. it's a little different when somebody's trying to hit you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little different. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's really awesome, and you guys, of course, won the championship we in did. 2011, yeah. and I couldn't find much information on that, but of course, you are you were the catcher for the yeah. team at that time. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just like grown men having a good time. I mean, it's, you know, we, we take it seriously, but it is like adult Little League. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it, it is kind of like that. It's just grown-up guys who have jobs, and some of them, you know, wives and kids dressed up in baseball uniforms and going off to Phoenix for six days to play baseball, which is great. You know, it's a great... Uh, Great vacation. Was there anyone on the team who you were just like, I really didn't think you were this kind of person, like celebrity or otherwise that you met through this, that you were just like, um, didn't expect them at all to see them there? You know, there was a, you know, the, <laughs> I can't remember, there were a couple of actors in the league. There's a lot of actors that play. Um, and then there'd be some former major league players, you know, guys okay. that were older that would come back and, and they loved baseball so much that they'd still play with guys like us who were, you know, just amateurs, guys that played in the big leagues, in the major leagues. They'd come back and play. They so give that, you all cards? No, you know, they were serious <laughs> about it on the field. I mean, there wasn't any of that going on. But uh, I had a great time with it. That's They're really, really awesome. So I want to move a little bit into the music career because sure. this kind of encompasses a lot of what you're all about and a lot of kind of where your passions lie because as a voice actor you get to experience the industry from one standpoint and then as a musician you get to experience from another standpoint but Hollywood's really all about who you know so it's great to see how the two can mesh how the experiences from one can move into the other like you were in Las Vegas for Blue Man's group and ended up doing this and that's mm -hmm. how you got into voiceover so with music career you've been a drummer through and through I don't I know when you started singing because I know you did a little bit of backup for for Dada, yeah. but I didn't know. I don't. I can't like name off the top of my head like a song that you sang alone in, from Dada. No, I never. Uh, you know, I had some some uh, f kind of, you know, in, in uh, a couple of our tracks, I'd have uh, sections where I would sing. But no, I wasn't the lead singer in that band by any stretch. I was the third voice. I was a trio, and I was the third voice in it. Uh, but I always sang, you know, uh, not only in the band, but. Uh, I was a songwriter before I ever got into Dada. I had a publishing deal when I was just out. Of, just you know, I went on the road when I when I came out of high school, okay. and uh, following that, I got I got involved in uh, songwriting first before I ever got into Dada. Um, and for people who don't know, that's a band from the early mid '90s had a hit, a song called "I'm Going to Disneyland." Mm -hmm. um, it was on IRS Records, and we had a nice little moment in the sun in the in the early 90s and you know we've been able to carry it for for quite some time but um i started my music career as a professional as a drummer in uh in cover bands and show bands traveling you know like i started in uh alaska going up to alaska for two months to play in bars and going to hawaii to play in bar bands cover bands and then following that uh i got involved with uh, some people here some friends of mine and we started a uh, started writing songs together and we ended up getting a little publishing deal with warner chapel uh, music publishing and i was doing that when i met these guys mike and joey mm -hmm. who started this band called dada and i kind of put that to the side to go with them and we got a record deal and you know it, it seemed like the right decision at the time it kind of yeah. worked out next thing i know i was you know on stage at the greek theater opening for sting so it seemed like the right thing to do um <laughs> but uh yeah i haven't really been singing on stage that much until now you know m much more so now than ever before because yeah you've always you've really been the drummer i mean you of course you had the job in the blue man group which if, if people don't know this, the Blue Man Group is not the same three guys for the <laughs> past 25, 30 years. It's no. always been 
ex rotating members. Well, yeah, they did. Those three guys that started Blue Man Group, um, their names are Chris, Matt, and Phil. They started this thing in New York as a kind of a performance art piece, a street. It's kind of like Stomp in a way, but Stomp is the newer version. That's they, kind Stomp of, yeah. was way after them. This thing was much more like uh, avant-garde kind of. Uh, I mean, they they one of their first. Uh, pieces was a thing called the funeral for the 80s that they did on the streets of Manhattan. I don't I think they showed it on MTV back back in the day. I, I don't remember what that was, but uh, but that's I know that was one of their first pieces. I, I don't think I ever saw it, but it was really more like street theater, avant-garde street theater. And then they sort of, you know, one of them was kind of into science and the other one was uh, um, a drummer and the other guy was an actor. And they sort of put all these things together to create this thing called Blue Man Group genius idea mm -hmm. and then to put them in you know blue masks so that they could hire a bunch of other guys to do it and if this thing can go on forever and they own the whole thing I mean, it was a brilliant idea but those guys did like five thousand shows in a row they only oh, had wow. it was the three of them uh, the three of them initially and and a three-man band did every show at this theater in new york for i think five thousand shows was it intimidating when they brought you on like were you kind of just well, yeah that thing is like um that was, a, that was a really interesting audition process because I happened to open up an L.A. Weekly one day. This is how things happen. You know, if you're, you got to be looking, right? I'm, uh, this is p post record deal, trying to figure out what to do next, really. Like, out of money, nowhere to go, no job. Like, am I going to have to mm -hmm. go back to the real world and get a job? Um, which was, you know, unthinkable. Um, <laughs> actually, I did do it. I went back for a day, worked at a delivery, you know, package delivery job. I, uh, and um, ended up at the home of one of the most famous record producers uh, that, that ever was, a guy named David Foster. Uh, ended up delivering a, a, a package to his house and then rolling over to MCA Records, where I used to be a signed artist, mm -hmm. and showing up there in a shirt that said Speedy Delivery and, and bringing a package to the A&R department there. The girl on the other side of the desk was kind of like, you? <laughs> you know, she couldn't believe it. <laughs> At that point, I thought, i got to do something else. So I flipped open the LA Weekly, and there was this open call for a Blue Man group, send your stuff in. So I put a package together and um, did an audition, I think, here in Los Angeles, and then you know, passed the original audition, and they brought me out to New York. Yeah, it was very intimidating because, one, I had never done any theater mm -hmm. kind of things. I was always a rock and roll guy, a club sort of musician. Um, and they had brought me players in from New York, from Boston, from Chicago, from the University of Miami. A lot of guys who were uh, pre some hotshot uh, drummers, guys from Berkeley, guys who, from their other shows, all trying to get this job in Las Vegas. And, uh, yeah, I felt like I was a little over my head, but they kind of wanted a real raw sort of drumming approach. And uh, I, I guess, you know, I was right for it, so I ended up getting that job and getting out to Las Vegas for a while. But, you know, I think, to, to get back to voiceover for a second, I think there's a parallel or there's a connection between playing the drums, playing music, and doing voiceover. I mean, you have a lot of guys who are on-camera on actors that come to it, mm -hmm. but then there's some guys who... I'm not the only musician who's ended up doing it, and there's a rhythm to voiceover and a and a and a flow for and a pacing for commercials that I think uh, my music experience is helpful in getting that feel across. And whenever they play the music, you know, there's always music backing up a commercial. Whenever I can hear that in advance, that really tells me what kind of an attitude it sets you know, the tone for everything really you're going to do, it every really decision does. you'll yeah. make. Since music then. is so powerful like that, so. You know, just as, as an offside question, like, how hard do the Blue Man Group party? Like, when you guys do a big... Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, there has to be a story of, like, you guys don't take that makeup off. You probably get off stage and just party oh, as the Blue Man well, Group. Well, I mean, the, the, the Vegas thing back in the early 2000s when we got out there, you know, this was a collection of uh, misfits and, and, you know, lunatics from various backgrounds and, you know, they wanted a lot of rock guys to play on this thing. They weren't looking for trained theater kind of drummers. They were looking for rock players. So they put all these lunatics together in Las Vegas, a city that's open 24 hours a day. <laughs> we got off work at 1230 and, you know, we just they unleashed us on Las Vegas, which was, you know, fun. Uh, two years, though, I had to get out. Some of those guys are still out there. I don't know how they survived it because wow. it, it was dangerous. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we partied pretty good. And then one time I took a, a trip with them to Mexico City. And, I mean, people were just, it was, it was off the hook in Mexico <laughs> City. <laughs> and this was before you were married. Uh, it, was, yeah, it, was, <laughs> okay. it was. It was. Just making sure. Yes, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so 
you of course we talked about Dada a little bit. You are going to be you're going to be on the series Rock and Roll Stories on KLCS TV and Vimeo fairly shortly for an yeah. interview. Um, I couldn't find that out now, so that's probably going to be coming out in the next month. I haven't or done two. it yet. You haven't done it yet. No, really, you have it's a credit. July. You haven't even done it yet. That's pretty awesome. Well, I'm, lo I'm looking no forward idea. to that. I had no idea. Uh, <laughs> um, so of course you are now. You're like man of the hour right now among a, a lot of these a lot of these indie fans like because of course people mention like the whole word hipster people yeah. say hipster but it's not it's not hipster it's just people who are fans of the underground scene who mm. find these artists and really kind of are attracted to them for their charisma for their music and just for the different unique kind of sound that they bring to the industry that has kind of been faded out over the years with the really high production value and the doing takes over and over again, yeah. having people who don't write their own music being featured on radio. Right. So it's it's really great to see, of course, this is alongside Julie Callio, who was from Dada. Right. You guys are now Seven Horse, and I mean, I call this kind of like the four days in the saddle. The, the, uh, the, the, re the, the revival, and not the revival story, the creation story of yeah. Seven Horse is All like right. four days in the saddle. You yeah. guys had a studio for four days. Right. That, of course, your engineer, I've, did not write his name down. Scott Gordon. Scott his, his, home, his home studio. We worked with Scott for years. Scott uh, does uh, a lot of the... Uh, he composes music for the television show Criminal Minds. That's mm -hmm. kind of what his main gig is uh, over the last several years. But we've been working with uh, Scott since uh, the you know IRS Records days with Dada in the mid-90s. Um, we had planned on going in to uh, record some, some more Dada stuff. And... Uh, we weren't able to pull the session together, which kind of was the story of the band for a long time. Uh, but Scott said, hey, why don't you guys just come in? And, and uh, my partner Joey and I had been talking a lot about doing some different kinds of music because we kind of we, we kind of felt frustrated in the confines of this band that we'd been in for a long time, which was, you know, certainly had a cult following and was successful by anyone's estimation. The band was successful. I mean, just to be able to go out and tour, you have to feel good about that, to have mm -hmm. an audience that, that has supported you for a long time. Um, but nevertheless, we were looking for something else to do. And uh, this, this uh, studio time became available uh, Scott suggested we come in there and um, we had been you know kicking around some ideas and the second day in we cut this track called meth lab Zoso sticker he had sent me this this uh, riff via iPhone we did a lot of our songwriting by voice memo from and phone to phone because he actually, lives in Seattle we actually have a, uh, a soundbite from meth lab Zoso sticker if Marissa wants to go ahead and play that for us real quick just so people know exactly what we're talking about yeah, at this okay. point I love that pause. You do. It's kind of addictive. It's hypnotic in a way. I hope so. That's the idea. It's it's definitely been the jump off for a lot of what has been happening with Seven Horse, well, which yeah. we'll get into in a moment. All right, thanks, Marissa. So so you were saying you he sends you this riff. Yeah, he sends me this riff. It says Meth Lab Zoso sticker on it you know, on the file that you get via text message. It's like, wow, what is that? I've never heard of that. I mean, I know what a meth lab is. I know what Zoso is. That's a Led Zeppelin thing. I wasn't exactly sure what a meth lab Zoso sticker was. I assume maybe it was a Zoso sticker stuck on the outside of a meth lab. Perhaps. Right. Um, Logic why, would dictate. You know, apparently, though, his story is that uh, he was just putting a few words together just to label this thing. That wasn't his intention to have me make that the title. But I took, <laughs> but I took that and I just started rolling that over in my head against that riff. And I came up with this, this uh, lyric that kind of was reminiscent of sort of an old blues kind of motif. Um, there's a song called uh, The Candy Man by a guy named Mississippi John Hurt, which is an old country blues. And there's a lot of blues that kind of uses a lot of euphemism uh, and sexual innuendo. And I was kind of feeling that. So I put this thing together. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of sexual language in music today, mm -hmm. but not exactly like that. That's a little bit of a different sort of <laughs> twist on it. Um, so that was day two in the studio for us. And that's the track that, uh, you know, cut to a year and a half later. And uh, the uh, summer of uh, 2013, we get, a, we get an email from somebody representing Martin Scorsese saying, we would like to use your song Meth Lab Zoso sticker in the film The Wolf of Wall Street. So... What was your reaction at that time reading that email? You were just well. Like, he, uh, we both thought, is this a joke? I mean, is this some kind of a scam? Is this where you, where do you enter your social security number so they can, you know, get rip you off? Um, but lo and behold. It was real. You know, we checked it. We followed it back around. And so uh, 
of course, we said we'd, we'd love to be in the Wolf of Wall Street. But, you know, we didn't know exactly how this thing worked. And the first thing you have to do is um, you have to give them a quote. How much is it going to cost? They want to know from me what I want to have the song in the Wolf of You're Wall just Street. Like, uh... I, I do it for free, of course. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't want to tell them that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I started to do some research. And I've been in the music business a long time, but I had never uh, actually, there's always somebody in between me and this person yeah. now it's just directly to me so i'm handling the negotiation myself and trying not to blow it because the word on the street was is that if you come in too high they're just going to pass mm -hmm. they won't like come back to you with a counter offer they'll just disappear so we didn't want that to happen um so we gave them a number and they were like yeah okay we'll take it to the appropriate person and uh you know if you if you end up in the film because what's happening is the song is currently cut into the movie but he's still editing the movie yeah and at any time you could end up being taken out, replaced. He, he does. One day he wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, looks at the movie, and says, "No, I don't like that anymore." You're Turns gone. on the radio, thinks yeah. something would go right. better. Yeah, all of a sudden, uh, "Gimme Shelter" is in there instead because he likes the Stones a lot. Um, so they said, "You know, just hang out, wait for the. You know, if if if, if you're going to stay in, you'll hear from us. If not, you'll never hear from us again. Mm. See ya." <laughs> you know? So let's hurry up and wait. Yeah, give us this much. quote right now, and then yeah. you know what? Wait. And so we'll it took tell months. You. It took months and months, and we didn't find find out till October. That mm -hmm. we actually were in the in the movie. Was that like right around when they put the trailer out too, though? That's when we found out. The trailer came out. <laughs> and we're, we're in the airport. We're coming back from Milwaukee. Meanwhile, we had finished our second record. The last day of recording, we finished it in Milwaukee. We went out that night. We got completely blasted. I was really hungover, sitting in the Milwaukee airport, uh, you know, trying to get a Coca Cola down just to settle things down. And my partner looks at the phone. He says, "Hey." My brother just sent me a text message saying, I heard the trailer. You guys sound great in the trailer. We're like, what? Because we, we knew that we, mm -hmm. we, we might be in the trailer. We weren't sure. Um, so that's when we kind of found out that everything was happening. And, you know, what a thrill. That's, I mean, that's absolutely amazing because a lot of, you don't really know the, the behind for how movies pick up songs for that. And, of mm -hmm. course, they can, they can kick you out. They can put yeah. you in. You can be in the trailer and not be in the movie. Right. Uh, you guys got a lot of playtime in the movie. We did. Which is fantastic. It's like and five and a half minutes worth. It's pretty good. It, it's there's a lot of cacophony going on. Yeah. There's a lot of um, yeah. craziness going on, to, yeah. to say the least. But you know what, man? That's like one of the thrills of my career is being in that movie. Because what's so great about films is, like, I mean, they, number one, they show them over and over again. I mean, mm -hmm. his, his Scorsese stuff is always on. It's classic. It's done. And yeah, I mean, you know, it's like this film was very controversial. A lot of people hated it. Um, but I thought that was really cool to be in a movie that was so controversial rather than to be in a movie that was like, yeah, that's a good movie, but no one really cares about it. This movie had a lot of heat on it. And um, so, you know, and it, and it stays, it's there forever. So it's a real thrill whenever that pops on. You know, when I'm 80, I'm going to be able to go. Oh, there, 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 there. I'm just going to be imagining people taping money to the inside <laughs> yeah, of people's legs. Exactly. <laughs> so I think I think that's absolutely amazing. And um of course, uh, you can get Meth Lab Zoso sticker on Let the Seven Horse Run. That was your first Our album. First record, right? And then I do want to ask you, because you, you talk about, of course, you work with Joey and he's your partner in the mm -hmm. band. What are some of the difficulties of having just two people in a band? Because I know you're so used to, for so long, having a three-person trio. Right. And now you have only two people. You sing and play drums at the same time, which is... It's not too many of us around. Yeah. You know, Levon Helm, if you go way back, the band. Uh, Don Henley, the mm -hmm. Eagles. Ringo sang a little bit. Um... Uh, you know, there's not that many leads. I don't know who's doing it today. I know uh, maybe the, I uh, uh, can't remember the name of that band. There's a couple of duos where the drummer sings. And there's a lot of people who try, but like you yeah. got to be good at it for yeah, it to well, work. It's tough, man. That's yeah. a tough trick because it's so physical playing drums and then singing on top of it and trying to sort of front the band. So that's a challenge in and of itself. To make a full sound with two people just doing guitar and drums, one, the guitar's got to be incredibly loud. Um, but, you know, if you can make it sound, the, the more you take away, if you can still make it sound good, you're really doing something, you know, because it's easy to make things sound good when you layer a bunch of stuff on it and bring a laptop on stage and push that button and have tracks running and backing vocals coming in from all over the place. Um, but we don't do any of that. So we, we just get up there and with what we've got and try to make the best sound we can. And, uh, you know, that's how we like it. So, I mean, to quote you, you did say, if we can be a two-man Rolling Stones, I yeah. mean, let's do well, it. Well, you know, the Rolling Stones are kind of like a... It's kind of, they're kind of like the archetype of a rock and roll. They're still the world's greatest rock and roll band. And, and they're, they're still you know, around. They're, they're still, still around. Still doing. So it's a real, they're a real inspiration for a guy like me because I've been playing for a long time. And, you know, I want to keep doing it. And I, I respect those guys for not only for all the great music they made, but for the fact that even in the face of people, oh, they're too old, don't, you know, they should go away. They should die already. You know, th those guys are still out there playing. And that's kind of like, 
you know, what the blues guys did. They didn't just stop because they got old. They kept playing and kept playing. That's what you do. You know, why stop? Well, what else are you supposed to do? You know, so um, they're, they're a, a, we always we think about the Rolling Stones a lot when we were in the studio or making, you know, coming up with songs and, and doing stuff like that. Because we've been doing this for another 30 years. You we know? could. Yeah, we could. You, you might why need not? To, I mean, if Keith Richards is still alive after all the crazy crap yeah. he's done. I haven't done half the stuff he did. <laughs> I should be able to go there easy. But he's never been in the Blue Man group. That's true. You, you got I mean, that. We'll and he's, that, we'll never had a song, he's never had a song play in a movie with Martin Scorsese. Well, no, that's not true. Yes. <laughs> with, no, with, with money being strapped to people's legs. I got to clarify because right, right. you know, of course, right. he has. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and going in, you, you say like hitting a laptop and doing yeah. all that. And that is kind of where music has kind of gone with, of right. course, where I talked about overproduction of yeah. songs. But I do want to ask your, your opinion on, on that with, like, you know, there is a lot of interest in sampling music these days. And with artists like Avicii using Ello Black and people like that to be in their songs and they're being hit songs. Yeah. Because we've, we've dev dubstepped from a music standpoint, has developed from being just the wub wub craziness to featuring female singers, to featuring male singers, and now they're pulling in country. Right. And I feel like rock and roll and blues is kind of going to be the next step. So if somebody came to you and offered to collaborate with you and sample, let's say... Um, it's already happening. It's, it's, already already happen happening. it's already happening. I don't have anything against it. It's not what, you know, if somebody wants to take something that we've done and create something new out of it, I don't hold it. I mean, great, go mm -hmm. for it. You know, I... I I, there's a thing about you know playing in a band where you you kind of get this kind of like uh, you know the, this uh, sort of you know uh, aggressive kind of like we're going to go out there and kick everyone's ass mentality. That's just kind of part of being in a rock and roll band. So you always think what you know your band is 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 uh, you know you you have you you take on this uh, persona. But I don't really. You know, it's really not about, for, for us, people can do whatever they want. I don't have a problem with the direction that music's going. I think that there's a hole in the market, to use that word, in music, where there, isn't a, there, there aren't a lot of people doing what we're doing. There are some, but they're having problem. you know, they, they don't become as popular as the mainstream stuff. I mean, we're not playing mainstream kind of, when you, if you're playing rock and roll these days, old school, kind of stripped down, guitar, drums, rock and roll, that's really not you know, not super slick. That's not really mainstream music right mm -hmm. now. But if that's, you know, there's obviously there's an audience for the mainstream pop, you know, pop uh, electronic dance music that seems to be the driving force in music right now. But that's just not what I want to do. So we're going to go our own way and we figure, uh, we think we have an original sound and we think that there's going to be some people that like it. And it seems to be happening that way. Do you, you said it's happening right now, though. Did you ever allow anyone right now, or like could someone find potentially? Yeah, there's a track Skrillex that, with well, no, Seven Horse. There's a track that's going to come out. Check this out. There's a track that's going to come out with Method Man. Really? Yeah, doing a thing <laughs> with uh, Seven Horse. That's actually really awesome. Yeah, it and that's kind cool. of like I can imagine the whole hip hop going into against that, that riff. Na, 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 boo, gee, God, you know. And then cutting it riff. to you. I got a method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you, you can imagine it. I can imagine You're it right now. Get to hear I can I can probably download it on iTunes and. Right. Pay like a dollar fifty two. Uh, I don't think it. it's out yet. It's coming out though. But right. when it does, right. I, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. I know a lot of people who will be yeah, downloading. Some people it. might might think it's cool. Um, and then I do want to ask. Uh, I keep losing my place on my pay on my uh, on my notes. Sorry, it's your first show. It's all right. I know, right? Um, who like if you had a choice right now, like seven horse featuring who? Who would it be? Oh, I don't see it now. Uh, don't see it happening? I, I, well, I don't even think about that. I, I just want to go out there and do our thing. I really do. I mean, that's what we've been... Uh, the whole reason we do this is so we can get onto a tour bus and roll around the country and play shows for people. I mean, that's what it really... Like, for me, that's what a band is supposed to be about, is getting out and playing live. I mean, I love the recording studio, and I love doing voiceover. It's a great job. And, the, you know, you mentioned two different sides of the industry because, you know, when I'm doing a voiceover... When, you, when you're a voiceover guy, you're the last one in on a commercial. Like, they've shot the entire commercial. It's edited. They've got all the sound effects in. They've got everything ready to go. The last thing they do normally is drop the voiceover in, and then the commercial's out the door. So you're, they all want this thing done as quickly as possible and correctly for, for, for their aesthetic. So you go in there and you do the job really professional, and you give them what they want. That's your mindset going in. I'm going to give these people what they want and get out of their way so they can do what they want to do with this spot and get on to the other things they have to do. But, you know, on the music side, I'm the creator, so it's a whole different uh, approach. It's a whole, it's, it's much more self-indulgent, obviously, but it's much more artistic, and it ultimately leads to 
getting in a tour bus and driving around the country and playing shows for live audiences because that's the thing that really is the essence of uh, you know what I love to do in life is to play these gigs. So you know we're just trying to create a situation for ourselves where we can go out and continue to do this. So it's just the road because of course everything you do really is about traveling and meeting new, interesting new people, interesting Pretty new much. stories. I mean I love the road. I've always loved it. Well, you better. I mean, you got this new tour. <laughs> yeah. You got this new tour coming out. Um, right. You're going to be uh, in Virginia, June uh, 7th, was it? it? Ju um, Virginia, Georgia. I think we start up in Niagara Falls. I've never been there, but I, we're starting up in Niagara Falls on uh, the 7th, and then um, we're going to just do a few dates in uh, Pittsburgh and in New Jersey, and then we're going down the Eastern Seaboard, and then we're coming back around in uh, July. So we're, you know, we have a lot of plans to to be out on the road a lot this year, and it's all kind of coming together right now. And a lot of people, it takes it takes it takes a village to get somebody out there. And I know you guys got a two man village, but you also have <laughs> a lot of people who believe in you guys. And you have a great fan base. Yeah. And right now you're actually working on, they're probably, they just filmed your music video. We just shot a video for our uh, single Flying High with No ID. It's and the we, first single off uh, the, our record, Songs for a Voodoo Wedding, comes out June 10th. The single is out right now. And I believe you have a clip. We be we, I believe we have a clip as well. <laughs> Marissa, go ahead and throw that, uh, throw that audio up there. And we have the uh, album cover here. This is for the oh, yeah, single, the EP go. that you released. Look at that handsome dude. I know, Joey looks great. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. I know, right? If only you had a uh, drum set in yeah, here like you would on a Tonight Show. It would show. be a great team. I mean, you could, I could be the straight man and you know, do, do the that rim for shots. After Buzz, all our after shows. All right, yeah. And of course, this is about a situation where you guys, Joey well, was flying in. No, 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 it was me. It was I, you, okay. I took a trip to New Orleans and I got to the airport and uh, I try, try to get on an airplane without your driver's license. That's all I can say. I don't want to give any more away. You got to hear the rest of the song. But you know, I mean, we knew a you, lot of If you stories. know the name of the song, you, you yeah, can kind of out with no ID. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, it, it can be done. That's all I can say is you you can in fact uh, get up. But it's uh, it's about uh, this trip to New Orleans that that we took. But you know, it's about a, a lot of other things too. I don't like to be too specific about what songs you know, the lyrics are about. Mm -hmm. That's you know, you want to leave a little bit. People got to gotta interpret it. Sure. Um, but yeah, we're really excited about this record coming out. And uh, I'm really excited to get back out on the road and, you know, do voiceover sessions from various hotel rooms around the country. <laughs> How long has it been since your, your first music video? I mean, your oh, last music yeah, video. Oh, like, man. Yeah, the, we haven't shot a music video in a long time. Uh, the Dada days, that was, you know, in the 90s was the last music video. And, and I really hated it back then. This one was <laughs> a lot of fun, actually. The guy that we worked with on this thing was really good they had a great crew and uh, the whole experience was really fun and i think that the the, the piece is really going to be going to be amusing <laughs> it's going to be fun to watch i i've heard stories a little bit of what it's about uh, yeah, i'm not going to give it right. away but uh but yeah i'm definitely yeah. looking forward to that uh that do you have any idea around the tentative date that uh, might we're be trying to get everything ready for this release you know the release date's june 10th for the record and i i would assume the video is going to come out right around the same time and we we have the album cover for Songs from a Voodoo Wedding. Oh, man. <laughs> what was going on that day? Listeners, you got to check, uh, check out YouTube to see this wow. if you're listening on iTunes. So Joey, of course, got a seven-horse tattoo on his arm. He did. Now, you know, I'm, a lot of people don't know who we are. They're seeing us right now. This is the first time they've ever, you know, they don't know who I am. They don't know about Seven Horse. They certainly don't know about Dada, and we're mm -hmm. giving them a lot right off the bat here. But, you know, this guy, my, my bandmate, got the band name after being in a band together for 20 years under a different name. He goes out and gets the new name tattooed onto his arm. So I think we've made a commitment in the direction that we're yeah, going. I, I, I don't know if, anyone, if any of our old fans have any question about the direction this thing is going right now. I think he's made it perfectly clear. Uh, you know, not that we don't love the old days. Um, but as I said to you off the air, I mean, who wants to talk about stuff they did 20 years ago for the rest of your life? I mean, you know, a lot of the, uh, my, uh, contemporaries, guys that came up at the same time I did, um, you know, were still playing their hit from 20 years ago or their hits and they're playing the county fairs and the casinos. And that's totally great. I mean, if we had, you know, five or six hits, we'd probably be doing it. But, uh, I wasn't really ready to sort of look back on stuff that much. I feel like it's you still want to keep going forward, you know, keep being creative. That that's really what keeps a band alive. Speaking of creative, though, the the picture does say more than a thousand words. It does. I don't know what, but it does say, it says yeah, a few like, words anyway. How did that come to be? Well, you know, we were uh, we worked with this photographer. She's very artistic. We talked to her a lot about 
you know, I went up, to, went down to New Orleans for this voodoo wedding. Mm -hmm. So there was a voodoo thing going on. Now I'm no expert in voodoo or New Orleans culture, but I did go down there and get a taste of it. And I was really inspired by the whole experience. Um, the music, the food, the, uh, you know, lust for life down there, the, uh, the ability to just live in the moment, celebrate life without any guilt and without, you know, it's fun to be a little bit bad sometimes without having <laughs> to be guilty about it all the time. We're always trying to walk down the straight and narrow in this society. And, uh, you know, down there, it's like, forget all that. Let your hair down. Uh, what you have of it and, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and enjoy life. So that kind of permeated the music. And we wanted to get this, uh, this voodoo wedding somehow involved in what we were doing. So we called the record songs for voodoo wedding. And uh, I don't know, that was the photographer's idea. And we were so into just kind of rolling with it that day. We thought this might be, a, and when we saw that picture, we're like, well, that's the album cover. We're going to use that. <laughs> I mean, we couldn't think of anything more, uh, you know, ballsy to do than to put that out. Well, it's jarring. You see it in, yeah. if you see it on iTunes, you're going to be like, right. exactly. What? Is, I mean, that's the re the reaction I usually get is, whoa. You know, that's <laughs> whether that's good or bad, I don't know, but I don't care. So that that that's enough. It was obviously cold in there. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you were, you were quick Steve, little, sometimes good. sometimes yeah. I'm, I'm slow most of the time but quick sometimes I'm like a, I'm like a snapping turtle mm -hmm. um, so bringing this back to voiceover yeah. seven horses taking off I mean right. you guys it, there's no doubt about two it. years Martin Scorsese you got the second album dropping June 10th uh, songs from a voodoo wedding right. you guys are taking off right now your your goal has always been the music industry that has been your passion but do you believe as you get bigger with seven horse are you going to continue to do voiceover should we listen for you in commercials yeah hopefully what's going to happen is i can just get you know what you really like to have happen is just get more selective you know about what you do that's all you're really looking to do in you know once you get into show business if you can survive in it that's one level where you're pretty happy just to be able to make a living you know and and survive and not have to wait tables or mm -hmm. do whatever it else you, you it was that you used to do. So if you can get to that level, you're doing pretty good. The next level is trying to make, trying to have the ability to, to choose what you do, when you do it. You know, how much do I have to, do I have to audition? Right now I audition just about every day. I mean, that's really the job in voiceover for anybody who's thinking about doing this. The job is going out on auditions. And that's, I guess, the same for an actor, an on-screen actor, an on-camera actor. Um, but even, but on camera guys don't usually go out every day. Voiceover guys, there's a huge volume, which is great. There's a lot of work, a lot of possible work. There's tremendous competition, but if you're in the right, uh, if you, if you have the right sounding voice, if you're the, you know, in, within a certain age range and have this, the right sounding voice, there's a lot of work possible for you so you your job is to go out and audition day after day after day. And it's a numbers game. You, you know, you do a hundred auditions, you catch a gig, you do a hundred more, maybe you get two, you know, that's what you're trying to put together. You're just trying to do enough. Hopefully your agent is giving you the right pieces of copy. I mean, this is the real, if you want to talk about what this business is really about, it's like your agent is your lifeline to, to work. He's got to give you the right pieces of copy that you can be successful on. That's his job is to cast you in the right role and then your job is to come in every day and do the highest quality audition you can and then you walk away it's like you have no control over it after that so you just keep doing that and sometimes you get the gig sometimes they're looking for an orange you're an apple you don't get the gig and there's That's no life there's no point worrying about it just not really on to the next one not really well honestly i think we've kind of covered your life till now well i mean of course not the crazy parties and not the uh <laughs> yeah well we're not gonna get into that. <laughs> we don't have to get into that today um, the only thing we didn't really ask about was audiobooks and like the, the oh thing. man, I did one, did one audio did one book. audiobook, one audiobook. I did it at my home studio. It was uh, I, it took me like six, I don't know, about three months to do. It was a huge wow, eighteen hour audiobook. It's the first and last one I ever did, and I, I might do another one, but man, that's a lot of work, and that's a whole other end of the business. It's the thing about voiceover; it's very compartmentalized too. It's like the com the the animation guys, the commercial guys, you know, the character actors, the audio books. There's a lot of different parts of the business, and just because you're good at one, the promo guys, the movie trailer guys, there's all kinds of different voices. There's a lot of different ways to go. Not every most people don't do it all. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, I mean, 
I've, I've learned a lot today. I hopefully, bet you have. <laughs> hopefully our listeners have learned a lot. And um, I really do want to thank you for joining us today. I mean, this was the voice of. This was our very first I'm interview really, talk show. I'm honored to be on the show. I and mean, I appreciate you asking me. Thank you, Stephen. And today, of course, if you haven't been paying attention, we've had today Phil Levitt, a commercial voiceover actor who has been in the industry for many years, who also is in his band Seven Horse, which you can check out their new album, which is dropping June 10th. It's called Songs for a Voodoo Wedding. You can find them as well at sevenhorsemusic.com to find tour dates and see them live. And where can your fans find you on social media to keep in touch with you in the off seasons? Yes. Go to Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash seven horse. Uh, on Twitter, uh, at seven horse underscore. And uh, there must be an Instagram, but I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Probably the fan ones <laughs> yeah, created by somebody, someone. Someone who will know about Instagram. But if you go to Facebook and like the Facebook page, then, you know, you get to know everything that's going on. Did you have anyone you wanted to shout out while you're on the air? Just no, I don't do shout <laughs> Good to know. Well, <laughs> thank you again for joining us, Phil. My um, pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. I'm, uh, again, I'm your host, Stephen Lemieux, for this interview. I am... Uh, on Twitter, at Stephen Lemieux, that's S-T-E-P-H-E-N-L-E-M-I-E-U-X. Go ahead and follow me. Uh, shoot me a message on Facebook if you want. Go ahead and go to AfterBuzz TV. Like our Facebook page. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us five stars for this new podcast because we're going to need your ratings right off the bat. And check us out on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to us on YouTube and leave a comment because we want to know what you guys think. And we want to know how much you love Seven Horses Music, yes. how much you learn from our podcast because we want more input on what, we can, what other questions we could ask voiceover artists in the future. That's it. Oh, wow. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you on the next edition of AfterBuzz TV's The Voice Of. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz, Buzz you later. You later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals. Thank you for watching AfterBuzz TV on YouTube. For more of your favorite after shows and interviews, subscribe to our channel here and be sure to share your opinion on the episode in the comment section below here. We'd love to see what you guys are buzzing about. Thanks again. Buzz you later.